welcome to Wave Church SD Online. My name is Stephen Perez, and I'm a pastor on staff here at Wave. Uh, we are so glad that you are joining us for Church Online. Uh, we are in our final week of our Fear Not series, and over this past month, as we've gone through the Fear Not series, I've been reflecting on this fact that uh, I'm a performer. Uh, not a performer like Liza Minnelli, ah, but a performer in the sense that I get uh, so much worth and value based on how I perform uh, as a man, uh, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a therapist. And well, uh, in this season, I've, I've struggled a bit because I have no one to perform for. We're, we're sheltering in place. We're removed from our relationships. And I find myself asking, uh, am I doing a good enough job? Am I measuring up? Am I meeting expectations? Uh, and, and this lack of, uh, of being able to perform can create some anxiety and, and some stress and some doubt and some worry. And so this sermon series has been really great. And, and throughout this past month, God has been sharing this simple phrase with me again and again and again. And it's simply, Stephen, I love you. And that might not sound like the most profound thing, but to me it absolutely is. God loves me not because of what I do, because of what I accomplish, because of how much I get done, but simply for who I am. Um, and if you're a performer like me, I want you to hear this truth today, that God loves you. He loves you. He's pleased with you. He looks upon you fondly, and he has grace for you. And so I hope uh, that you can take that truth away and know that you are loved, not because of what you do, not because of what you accomplish, but simply for who you are. Hey, I just want to highlight a few things on our website so you can make the most of your church online experience. Down below this video, you'll find some videos uh, uh, to worship through songs. So if you'd like to continue to do that, you can click on those. Also, you'll find some links to some different resources on our webpage. We have some kids videos and additional kids resources. Uh, so if you want to uh, provide something for your children to have a worship experience this morning, we have that available for you on our website. I'd also like to highlight our contact card. Um, if you are new and visiting us for the first time, welcome. We're really glad you are here. We would love to get to know you and know how we could pray for you and encourage you. Uh, so please fill out that contact card. Um, maybe you've been with us for a while and you have a prayer request or a need you want to make known to us. Please fill out that contact card, shoot it our way so that we can continue to support you um, as a family, as the body of Christ. Also on our page, you will find a link to giving. Um, if you feel called to give during this season, Season, um, you could still do that. You could do that online or you can send a check into the Wave Church SD office. Um, but we want to make clear that this is not an expectation or an obligation for you to give. But if that's something God's been putting on your heart, uh, you can still do that. There's a link here uh, with all the information on how you can go about that. Hey, that's enough for me. Pastor Jason is up next and he has a fantastic final sermon in our Fear Not series. I'll see you all next week. God bless. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. For even though you walk through the darkest valley, and in the shadow of death, fear no evil, for I am with you. Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, for the Lord your God goes with you. For if you belong to the world, it would have loved you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world. For this time, I have told you these things, so that in me, you may have peace. For in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Hey, good morning, Wave Church. Welcome to Church Online. Hey, if this is your first time at Wave, welcome. Thanks for joining us online. I'm Pastor Jason, the lead pastor here at Wave. And if this is your first time, we would love to know about it. In fact, right at the bottom, there's a place for you to mark, hey, I'm new here. If you do, we'll simply send you an email welcoming you to Wave Church. We would love 
to meet you. Well, this morning, man, we're jumping into God's Word. I am so excited uh, for our passage this morning. But before we get there, I just want to take a moment to pause and say thank you to all of you that consider yourself part of the Wave Church family. You know, because of your generosity, even during this season when we're not gathering together, uh, we were able to bless our community in a way that I will never forget. You know, last Saturday, we had a little bit of a crazy idea. Uh, We said, man, what if we bought a bunch of flowers off of a local business? Flower shops were just beginning to open. And so we bought 250 bouquets of flowers And we decided we were going to give them away to you as our Wave Church family, but also to our community. And so myself and my wife and Pastor Tim and Lacey stood out on the corner and we gave out 250 flowers and the response was overwhelming. We had people crying in their cars asking, why in the world would you do something like this? You know, it was absolutely an encouragement for people. Uh, that don't know Jesus, that don't know his church, if anything, it was a real tangible way uh, that we were able to bring some hope during a very dark season. And so church, I love you. Thank you so much for the way that you have continued uh, to provide for God and what he's doing in our community. Well, this morning, we're wrapping up a series that we've been in called Fear Not. In fact, if you missed any of those, you can jump online onto our sermons page and watch those. But this morning, man, we come to a passage that I have been looking forward to for some time to preach on. You know, the most repeated phrase that God says in the scriptures is fear not. You know, in seasons where it feels like the world has been turned upside down, where people are stressed and worried and freaked out, God continually says, hey, don't be afraid. Fear not. Stop worrying. And it's, it's going to be okay. You know, you might not even consider yourself an overly anxious person or a worrier. I know I'm really not. I tend to be uh, an optimist. But we might be able to admit, you know what, during this season, there's been a little bit more anxiety. There's been some more fear and there's been some worry. And so this morning, uh, we are going to come to a passage that hits very close to home for me. In fact, personal confession, this last week, I had a moment where I said out loud, I've had enough, right? I I was done. I've had enough. I tap out. I don't want any more. Maybe you have said the same thing. You know, so much of life has changed. We're trying to do our best. We're being faithful. We're encouraging one another. We're putting on good faces. But, you know, there's just really no way to know how to plan from day to day or week to week. And so this past week, uh, we got news that the parks in our community were going to be open. Now, I had a vision, a dream. I was going to pack up the kids in the car. We love baseball. We were going to hit batting practice and throw and pitch and have a blast in God's glory at the park. And so I told the kids to get ready. And as they were getting ready, I had a thought in the back of my mind. You know, I would hate to drive them down there and have the park be closed. And so I quickly jumped in the car, ran down to the park, and sure enough, The gate was still locked. There was a police officer and a ranger right in front of the gate with the giant sign, Park, was closed. It was was false news. And I was absolutely demoralized. And as I drove home, I said out loud, I have had enough. You know, it doesn't take big things uh, to bring us to that point. Now, I know we're living in a time where there's some serious stuff going on. There's loss of income. There's loss of jobs. There's worries about health. We're not really sure how long we're going to be locked down. There's political upheaval. Uh, But even in the small things, we might have said, hey, you know what? I've had enough. Uh, Maybe you've had enough of working from home with your kids all around you. Uh, I know I have had enough of Zoom meetings. As much as I love seeing everybody, it could be a bit overwhelming. Maybe we've had enough of politics and news and pseudoscience. Uh, We've had enough of wearing face masks and and maybe eating our own cooking. We would just love to go out somewhere and to see people. Um, And to be honest, we're overwhelmed and done with our worry and stress and anxiousness. In fact, you know, next week, um, I'm really excited about this. We're kicking off a brand new sermon series on the book of Habakkuk. In fact, Some of you didn't even know there there was a book named Habakkuk, but there is a prophet. It's a little book, three chapters, and he wrestles with the question, can God be good when life is not? 
right? When life hits with the unexpected, it plunges us into a sea of questions, and we're going to discover something beautiful about God uh, in seasons of upheaval and uncertainty. I promise you, it's going to bless you. In fact, I'd encourage you, man, even maybe get some friends and family on. You can watch together. But this morning, we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 19. If you have a Bible, you can open it. We're going to have it up on the screen. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 19, there is an Old Testament prophet uh, that is much like us. In fact, this prophet, he really loved God. In fact, some might call him the greatest prophet outside of Jesus to ever live. You know, he saw God's faithfulness, his provision, his power. And yet we might be surprised this man was overwhelmed with anxiety. His name is Elijah. And Elijah was tasked by God to confront the wicked King Ahab. Out of all of Israel's history, he was the worst king. And even more, he was married to a wife, Jezebel. Uh, these two single-handedly led Israel into idolatry and evil. And so one day, God does for Ahab what God has done for many of us. He sent to Ahab a messenger encouraging him to turn back to God. This was Eliza's job. You know, maybe you and I have had a voice come into our life at one point or another. Maybe it was a pastor or a friend, and, and they sat you down, and, and they might have said something like this. You know, if you keep going this direction, it's going to ruin your life. And, and whenever we have this voice come into our lives, a voice of reason, we often say, oh, well, thank you. I, I so appreciate your wisdom. I was absolutely wrong. You're so right. Thanks for setting me straight. That's not at all what we say, right? Usually we're like, hey, go jump in a lake. I don't want to hear what you have to say. So God sent Elijah to be a voice, a prophet to Ahab. Now, Elijah had told King Ahab, hey, God's had enough. By the way, God often has enough as well. He says, it's not going to rain. Because you have led my children astray, I'm going to wake you up a bit. I'm going to bring a drought to get your attention. I'm going to ruin your economy. And so Elijah left Ahab, and Ahab thought, yeah, right. Well, two and three and four months go on, turns into three years and no rain. God eventually tells Elijah, hey, I think it's time for you to go into hiding because people aren't happy with you. Now, you have to imagine on Elijah's side, he goes, God, you, you did that. Why am I having to run and hide? So Elijah runs off into the desert, and God does some incredible miracles with him. You can read about that on your own. After three years, Elijah comes back. Naturally, he's a little bit afraid. The country is in drought and ruin, and he stands before Ahab and says, Ahab, God's decided it's going to rain, but before it does, we're going to have a little competition. I want you to meet me on top of Mount Carmel, a famous mountain there at the time, and you bring 850 of your prophets of Baal, and I'm going to come by myself, and we're going to build altars and see which one lights on fire with our gods. And so you have to imagine uh, it's a little bit of a showdown. And so they get up there, and the prophets of Baal have built their altar, and Elijah has built their altar, and they're beginning to do their thing. And take a look, 1 Kings 18, verse 21. How long will you go limping between your two different pigeons? These are Elijah's words to uh, Ahab. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. How long will you go around serving two different masters? You will be devoted to one or hate the other. We've heard that. How long will it take you to realize that the thing that you were devoted to is not getting you where you want it to go? How long will it take you to realize that what you were devoted to is leading you into disaster? And Ahab's prophets begin to build their altar. They're praying and dancing. We're told they're cutting themselves. And this lasts for hours and nothing happens. Take a look, verse 26. But there was no voice. Their God did not answer. And they limped around the altar and th that they had made. And at noon... Elijah began to mock them, saying, Hey, cry out louder. Isn't your God a God? Either he's musing or he's relieving himself in the bathroom. Or maybe he's on a journey. Or maybe he just fell asleep. Yell a little louder to awaken him. As Elijah is mocking this prophet, he begins to build his own altar. He lays the sacrifice on the altar, and we're told he begins to pour water on top of his sacrifice. Now, we're thinking there's no way that that's going to light on fire. 
Elijah prays a simple prayer, and the scriptures tell us that God sent fire down and lit the sacrifice on fire. The point was proven. Ahab is embarrassed. The story tells us Ahab seized all the prophets and killed them, right? Elijah's point is proven. Elijah says, Ahab, it's time to run home. Rain is coming. Now, this is the setup for our text this morning. And so before this text, you just have to understand, Elijah feels like a rock star at this point. I mean, if you and I were Elijah, we're on cloud nine. God speaks, we listen, we turn off the rain. God speaks again, and we turn back on the rain. We take on 850 prophets and defeated them. You would think Elijah would be afraid of nothing at this point. But as it turns out, Even God's most faithful servants who have seen God's power and provision have their breaking points where they say it's enough. And so this morning is not actually a story of one of Elijah's greatest victories. It's a story of one of his greatest defeats. In fact, I want to show you four mistakes that Elijah made when he had reached his breaking point. The story picks up 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. We're told Ahab told Jezebel, his wife, all that Elijah had done. And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, hey, well, well done. Good job. You, you won. We're going to surrender to God. That's not at all what she said. She said this, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not take your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. She threatens to kill Elijah. Now, from our perspective, we might expect to say, Elijah, to say, hey, bring it. Did you, did you see the fireworks show that I just pulled off at Mark Carmel? What does Elijah do? He's afraid. You know, Jezebel was the most powerful woman in the kingdom at the time, even more powerful than Ahab. She really did ruin the kingdom. And here is how he responded. Verse 3, we're told he was afraid. You might want to circle, highlight, underline that. And in his fear, he rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which we'll discover is in the southern kingdom. Elijah was in the north. He runs all the way to the southernmost part of the kingdom, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. Now, as Elijah is afraid, we might say, hey, Elijah, wait a minute. Don't you remember what God just did? You've seen so many things. Elijah, why are you afraid? Elijah in this moment realized, hey, I'm okay right now, but I'm not so sure about tomorrow. Worry, as we learned last week, is a preoccupation with tomorrow, this uncertainty. And so Elijah in his fear, he runs. Mistake number one, we run ourselves into the ground. This is what Elijah did when he was afraid. He literally ran himself into the ground. He ran as hard as he could for as far as he could. Now, now I bet if we dropped it to Elijah's life, we might say, Elijah, what are you so worried about? Look at God's faithfulness. We might even be tempted to say, Elijah, don't be afraid. But what happened? Elijah was blinded from God's past faithfulness because of a possible threat in the future. In fact, I want you to write that down. Focusing on a future threat is the quickest way to forget God's past faithfulness. When we forget God's faithfulness because we're obsessed with some future threat, it hasn't happened yet, but our minds are wrapped around it with worry and anxiety, we tend to do exactly what Elijah did. We freak out and we run long and hard for as long as we possibly can. Judah, Beersheba, was as far from where he started. It was actually a hundred miles. And so Elijah, he didn't just run for a day. He ran for two weeks. He ran four marathons. He ran and ran and ran because it was the only thing that he felt like he could control. You know, family and friends, I think this might be where many of us are right now. In a season that feels like everything is out of control, it's a bit uncertain. You've been given the blessing of time and space, and yet somehow we find ourselves running harder than ever. We're running ourselves into the ground. We're tired, exhausted, and stressed. You know, if I could be honest, there's been many nights where seven or eight o'clock comes and I could barely keep my eyes open. I am exhausted from running. You know, some of us, the problem is not right now. It's that in the months leading up into this pandemic, we were running way too hard to begin with. 
And now that the crisis has hit, we're in a land of uncertainties, a land of pandemic. We're afraid that, that the only thing that we could do is, is to run harder and faster. And if we were in Elijah's story, we might say, hey, stop. It's going to be okay. But here's what happened. Second mistake, we're told he was afraid. He rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba. But as he ran, we're also told that he left his servant there. Mistake number two, we shut others out. In Elijah's fear, not only does he run, but he leaves his servant in the dust, right? In Elijah's fear, he believed, I'm all alone in this. We talked about this last week. You're not alone in this. You are not alone in your stress or fear or worry. God knows you. He loves you. You are not alone in your worry. He's going to provide for every need. But the question is, why do we do this? In our fear or worry, we have this fight or flight mentality and we think, I have to fix this. It's all on my shoulders to provide for my family and to care for them. And we forget that the solution to our fear and angst and worry is often found in the spiritual community that God has placed you in. In fact, this is a profound truth that we need to hold on to. God's provision often comes through God's people. You know, in our fear and stress and worry, when we isolate, we forget that God's provision comes through His church, His people, and Satan would love nothing more than to get you alone. He wants to take you out. God designed His church to be the place where we lean on and depend on each other in times of stress and uncertainty. And when we do that, we discover what Jesus and His church is all about. I pro promise you right now, that Jesus is doing something in our church and many other churches that he has never done in our lifetime. And he's doing it because of COVID-19. You were discovering just how powerful Jesus and his church can be in your life. You're having meals delivered to your home where you're bringing meals to other people. You're encouraging each other. You're praying for each other. Some of you are watching each other's kids when we're going into labor and having kids. Jesus' church is very much alive and active right now. Just because we're not meeting together doesn't mean that Jesus' church ever closed. We are still the church and doing profound things for God's kingdom. Listen, this is why life groups are so important. You know, I've, I've had many nights where I've come home and just said, I'm done. I don't want to do life group tonight. I don't want to go. And the problem is, well, life groups are always in our house and I can't just go hide upstairs. And afterwards, I've always found myself saying, you know, I really needed that. Even our Zoom meetings, as much as we're Zoomed out after our meetings, I find myself thanking God because those people remind me constantly that I am not at all alone in this. I am reminded again and again of God's past faithfulness because God has faithfully put the church in my life. What does Elijah do? He runs in fear. He shuts the one person out in his life that could speak God's faithfulness into his life. And then we're told, verse 4, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and sat down under a broom tree. Then he asked that he might die, saying, Is it not enough now? O oh Lord, take away my life. I'm no better off than my father's. Mistake number three, we focus on the negative. Elijah's run himself into the ground. He's tired. He's exhausted. He's all alone. He's shut others out. Anybody that could speak something positive into his life. And he says these words, I'm no better off than my ancestors. I'm no better off than you fill in the blank. In all of my work and all of my running and all of my toil, I'm trying to fix it. I'm no better off than those that didn't do anything at all. I'm no better off than those that don't even know God. The whole time Elijah is running, he's shutting out the positive voices into his life. Listen, right now, it's not very hard to hear negative things, right? We're surrounded by negativity all the time, but we need to realize this truth. In fact, I want you to write this down. What consumes your mind controls your life. What consumes your mind controls your life. What is your mind consumed with right now? Is it the chaos of the world? Is it the uncertainty of what might be coming next? Or is it the certainty of Jesus? What we think about most directs our choices and decisions. In fact, this is important. You might want to write this down as well. The quality of your life will never exceed the quality of your thoughts. This might be a crazy thing to realize, but you could have a phenomenal life even right now 
in isolation during COVID-19. Why? Because the quality of your life will never exceed the quality of your thoughts. If our thoughts are focused on Jesus and his blessings, we can enjoy God and find happiness and joy even in this season, as crazy it might be. You know, over, over the years, uh, our family has gotten into mountain biking, especially right now. We have a little canyon by our house. We can't go many places. And so I've taken our kids mountain bike riding, and I've had to teach them uh, the primary single principle about, about, about mountain biking is, is where you look is where you'll go, right? When you see a giant rock in the trail, the way to not hit the rock is to look past the rock, not to look at the rock. If you look at the rock, you're going to hit the rock. You know, it's an incredible life principle. There are some scary rocks right now that might be in your path, right? An uncertain future. And we might freak out a little bit and we worry and we obsess and we look at those rocks. And when you do that, you are certain to get taken out by them. Or we can look past them to the God that is leading us beyond them. Elijah is the greatest prophet to ever walk the earth. And he has come to a point of deep despair, and now he's praying, God, just let me die. He's run himself into the ground. He's shut others out. His mind is consumed with negative thoughts. Family, this is serious, and it leads him to his last mistake. We forget about God. You know, this past week, I got news. Uh, There was a pastor and a speaker and author uh, that I have learned from and read from for many years. I have loved his books. I have loved his writings. Uh, He was part of a a very pivotal church planting movement about a decade ago, um, and the news came out that he took his own life. And I have reminded myself um, that this is a serious season. You know, the suicide rate has always been high, and now it's increasing. People are isolated. They fall for these mistakes. We run ourselves into the ground. We shut out people that could speak encouragement to us. We fill our lives with negative thoughts. And lastly, we forget that there is a God that loves this. How did he get there? We're not sure. We don't really know his story. But the reality is for some of us, this season is much darker for them than it might be for others. And we as the church need to be reminded to open our eyes. We need to check in on the isolated. We need to check in on them. And we need to remind them this, that fear is godless. It gives us a reality without God in it. God is in our story, but fear removes God from the picture. Fear is a false prophet. It always gives us a story, a future that is not true. And fear is a thief. It robs us. It kills and steals and destroys the life that Jesus had for us. We need a church that boldly and courageously declares the opposite. And some of you right now today, you need to hear this. Maybe you find yourself in deep despair. You're finding yourself getting deeper and deeper. You need to hear right now that your life is more valuable to God than you think it is. He has a plan and future for you, even if you cannot see it. God is not done with you yet. God knows you and loves you, and you are not alone. And as God's church, we are here for you. Don't isolate. In fact, right at the bottom of the site, there is a place where you could fill out a prayer request. You could write to us. We were here for you. We have some resources actually off on the side of this page that are there for you as well. Listen, family, if that's where you find yourselves, we are here for you. We love you. God is not done with you yet. And to prove it, let's take a look at the next verse. Verse 5. As he lay down and slept under a broom tree, Behold, an angel touched him and said to Elijah, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lied down again. One meal couldn't re-energize him. He was still exhausted. And so the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for this journey is too great for you. In other words, Elijah, you're killing yourself. And your stress and your worry, do you see where you're getting yourself? This was never the journey that God had for you. He never called you to run away. This is not at all the journey that God is calling you to take. We're told, verse 8, So he arose and ate and drank and went in strength for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. Now, some of us might miss this, but Mount Horeb is extremely significant. You know, despite all of Elijah's mistakes, he made one choice that changed the direction of his life. Despite Elijah running himself into the ground and shutting others out and focusing on the negative and forgetting God, he made one choice that changed 
the trajectory of his life, he turned back to God. The one right move. For many of us right now, we're trying to figure out what's the next move. The one right move is always to turn back to God. Mount Horeb was Mount Sinai. Mount Horeb is where Moses found himself alone and experienced a burning bush. It was Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai where Moses received the Ten Commandments. This mountain was where God was. And when Elijah was as low as he could get, when life was as uncertain as it could get, when he is afraid, when he has run away, shut himself out, overwhelmed and stressed out, he goes to the only place where he thinks God might be. We're told he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is personal. Elijah has nowhere else to go. He's saying to himself, I'm going to go to the one place where I think God might be. You have to realize this is a step of faith. He doesn't know if God's going to be there or not. In fact, this mountain was thought to be holy, that you couldn't even touch it. But Elijah doesn't care. He just needs to go to a place where he think God might be. And he hears the word of God. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, the last time I left you, you were, you were 100 miles away. What are you doing here tomorrow? Suddenly, tomorrow seems uncertain and, you, and you've run away. What, why? Why are you here? You know, some of us, I think God might be asking us that question today. What are you doing here? When I was 22 years old, I heard these words from God. This story is personal. I had found myself running from God as as far as I could get. I had shut others off. I was consumed with the negative realities of life in my world, and I was living as if God didn't exist. And in that moment, in that place, at the bottom, as far as I could get, I heard the words of God, Jason, what are you doing here? This is not at all where I left you. This is not at all the life that I had planned for you. You know, I have a feeling that some of us were so stressed about tomorrow that we have been doing some running ourselves. Some of you, you've been running mentally. You're detached from your families because you're stressed about tomorrow. You're trying to figure things out. You're running yourself into the ground. You're shutting out those who could speak love into your life. You're surrounded by negativity of media, and you're forgetting that there's a God that loves you. Maybe you're distracting yourself with uh, Tiger King or binge-watching shows, or maybe it's with just too many glasses of wine at the end of the night. Some of us, we've physically run. You've run from your family, your marriage, your friends, maybe your parents. A lot of us, we find ourselves running away emotionally. You know, you are so overwhelmed that you've become unengaged with those around you. You're you're overwhelmed with stress and worry that at the end of the day, you have nothing left for those that are closest to you. And if God right now were to show up, he might say, what are you doing here? This is not at all where I left you. This is not at all the life that I had planned for you. Why have you run? Why have you allowed some uncertainty about tomorrow, some threat in the future to cause you to run from my faithfulness? You know, Elijah does what we all might do in crisis when God shows up. He begins to say, but God, you don't know. You don't understand. Let me tell you. And so he does. Verse 10, he says, Listen, Lord, I've been very jealous for you. In other words, I followed you. I've been faithful to you, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel, they've forsaken your covenant. They don't follow you. They throw down your altars. They killed your prophets with the sword. And even I, I'm the only one left, and they seek my life to take it away. What does God say to do? He says, go. I want you to note that. Circle it, highlight it, underline it. He says, go and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke it to pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the chaos. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, we're told, a sound of a low whisper. And that low whisper drew Elijah out of the cave. And when he heard it, he wrapped his face in a cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him. And God said the exact same thing. What are you doing here, Elijah? Why does God speak in a whisper? 
You know, this is often how he speaks. He speaks in a whisper because he's near. He's never left our side. Uh, we maybe just haven't been listening to him. He doesn't need to yell. He always speaks quietly in a whisper when we're ready to hear him. And Elijah repeats his same complaint. Lord, you have no idea. I've been jealous for you. I've been faithful for you, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel, they've forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. they killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, I'm the only one left. They seek my life to take it away. Elijah begins to repeat again to God. You know, God already knew. God already knew why Elijah was there. The question was not for Elijah to answer God. I think the question really was for Elijah to answer it for himself. Why am I here? What am, what am I doing here in my worry, in my fear, in my running, in my shutting other people out? I'm consumed with negativity. Well, God, if I could be honest, I was afraid. I love you and the people around me, they don't honor you. They've, they've killed all the other prophets. You know, God, it's not easy being a prophet. It's not easy following you when, when the world doesn't believe in you and love you. I was faithful to you when no one else was, and I am now being threatened for my life. That's why I ran. That's why I'm here. And I think somewhere in the middle of this conversation, Elijah is now talking to himself. And the Lord said to him again, Go. I want you to return your way in the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Now, Elijah might say, well, we already have a king, King Ahab. And he goes, I know, I have another king. And Jehu, the son of Nemesha, you shall anoint king over Israel. But God, they're already kings, and God is saying, I know, Elijah, I have a plan. I've always had a plan. As you've been freaking out, you've completely missed it. And you shall go, and you shall anoint Elisha, the son of Saphat, you shall anoint him prophet in your place. But God, I'm the prophet. And he says, I know. I'm going to continue the line of the prophets well beyond you because I have a future that you do not know about. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elijah put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. Elijah, I hope you're listening. There's still 7,000 in Israel that knees have not bound to Baal. And every mouth that has not kissed him, Elijah, you are not at all alone. Now, if you're Elijah, this, this is absolutely shocking. God is telling Elijah, listen, I have always had a plan. I have always had a future. And it includes you and all of your freaking out. You can run away. But Elijah, listen, your fear will never stop me from hindering my plan that I'm going to do in this world. Your fear and my fear will not hinder God's plan in our lives. You can run as far as you want, but God will have his way with us. God has a plan. He has a future. He has a solution. And just because you can't see the plan, his solution past our fears doesn't mean he doesn't have one. You know, in all of our fear, nothing at all has changed about God. God has not at all abandoned us. He has not given up on us. He is near. The question that we might need to ask is, what are we doing here? He still has work for us to do. God tells Elijah, you think you're the only one left, but surprise, you left them all in the dust. I got news for you. You're not the only one left. I still got people doing my work. My church, my kingdom, my people are still active on this earth, and so am I. So how do we respond to God's word this morning? We might want to answer this question for ourselves. What are we doing here? Why are we here? We're overwhelmed with stress or fear or worry. You know, if there is no God, then I can understand why we might be there. But if we say that we believe in God, a God who would give his one and only son to come to this earth to show us how much he loves us, to set us free from sin and fear and to live in freedom, then what are we doing here? We have seen God's faithfulness over and over again. We have experienced God's provision and power. Most of us have enough history with God, just like Elijah, that we do not have an excuse to allow worry to drive us to where we might be. God is still in control. He still has a plan and purpose for your life. And so I want you to write this down. Remembering God's faithfulness in the past gives us the faith that we need to face the uncertainties of tomorrow. For some of us, in order to go forward, we have to go back. We need to go back and remember, you know, the one decision 
that changed the trajectory of Elijah's life is that he turned back to God. He went to the one place where he knew he could find God. He turned back to remember God's faithfulness. And as he did, he found a God that was always there. Some of us, we need to go back to go forward. Do not allow tomorrow's worry to erase everything God has done in your past. Do not allow God's worries to make you doubt that God will be in your tomorrow. He has a plan and a purpose for you. So how do we respond? For all of us, we might need to admit. We might need to admit to God, you know what, I have been running myself into the ground and all it has gotten me is exhaustion. I am just running so hard and maybe I just need to stop. God, in my fear, I have shut some people out. I have shut out your wisdom. I have shut out your encouragement. I have shut out your church, your people. I have isolated myself. Maybe we could say, God, in my fear, I've, I've just focused so much on the negative and I've forgotten about your faithfulness. And God, in my fear, I've really been living my life as if I've forgotten you. And as we admit that, maybe we can begin to believe again that God indeed is near that we can believe that he really does have a plan and purpose for us, a future that we may not know, we might not be able to see, but we trust him. We believe that God does love us and that we are not at all alone. And in that, we can confess, God, we need you. There are some obstacles in our path that we can't see behind, but Lord, we do know that you're behind them, and we're going to trust you to get us into the future that is unseen. Lord, we confess that we need your son, Jesus Christ, to set us free from our sin and fear to lead us into a better future with you. In fact, right now, I would just invite you to, to bow your heads and close your eyes and, and, and to pray with me. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for the story of Elijah. Lord, if a man that is as close to you as Elijah finds himself in anxiety and fear, then uh, Lord, we should feel no shame when we come to those moments in our own lives. And Jesus, in our exhaustion, we come to you right now and we hear the words that you said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, your shoulders are big enough to carry and to bear the worry and the stress that we find ourselves in, that our world finds ourselves in. Jesus, we admit that we have run hard and we have run ourselves in the ground, that we have shut others out. We have even shut you out. We've been focused on the negative and we've forgotten just how good of a God you are. And in this moment, Jesus, we place our belief and trust in you as the Son of God who did die for our sins on the cross. Lord, you removed our fear that we might trust in you in this life and in the next. And we confess right now our need for you. Jesus, we need you. Lord, in every moment in the coming weeks and days ahead, we need you. Would you continually remind us, Holy Spirit, would you come into us? Would you remind us that we're going to be okay, that we don't need to run, we do not need to be afraid, that we have a God that has already overcome the world? Lord, we trust you in that now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, family and friends, I want you to hear this. I am so proud of you. I'm proud of the way that you are walking and trusting in Jesus. The days are uncertain, but our God is not uncertain. He is near. He will never leave us. And I pray today you might hear the small, quiet voice of God that ensures you that you're going to be okay. Now, for some of you today, you might have responded in some different way. Maybe for the first time you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we would love to know about it. As the church, we want to help you take a next step. And so right below, you can mark today, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ. For some of you, you have some needs or some worries and some stresses, some fears that you might need uh, the church to pray for you. And so we'd encourage you, please write those prayer requests down. We want to pray for you as a church. For some of you, uh, man, you have isolated, you've run, and you are not around the church to be encouraged. We have life groups that meet online all throughout the week. I would encourage you, if you're not yet in a group, you can mark down on our uh, connection card to join a life group, and we would love to get you plugged in. Family, I love you. I pray you have a great day. I cannot wait to see you back here next week for our new series as we cook off, kick off the uh, story of Habakkuk. We love you guys. God bless. We'll see you next week.